Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Player One Start. Today we're going to be talking about these flashback blast consoles that I found when I was out shopping one day. I actually didn't end up buying them at the brick and mortar store I found them at, because I did some research and found out I could get them cheaper online. But before we dive too much into these consoles, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the history behind the company behind these many flashback devices. There's not that much information about At Games as a company. Their official origin story states that they were founded in 2001 as a veteran player in digital media and information technology with a focus on interactive entertainment. Their most well-known products may be the Atari Flashback series, which has been produced and marketed by At Games under license from Atari Inc. since 2011. They've also produced a ColecoVision and Intellivision flashback console and had worked with Sega on multiple different handhelds and retro consoles. At Games is the sole distributor of Sega's console and PC games in China. And although their United States headquarters is in Los Angeles, some sources state that the company got its start in Bermuda. One interesting note about this company is that they often work with Hyperkin and Retrobit to help distribute their products around the globe. Hyperkin is more famous for developing things such as the Retron series of clone game consoles, as well as the Superboy. In 2018, At Games started releasing many kinds of HDMI dongle mini console sticks, bundled with Sega Genesis style controllers dubbed Flashback Blast. A quick look at their website reveals other products that they make as well. The old made new again, and officially licensed games all in one place. And here are some of the Sega Flashback consoles they made, including their original Atari Flashback. Looking specifically at the Flashback Blast, it is advertised as family fun showing features such as save, rewind, and other modern features. The advertisement says just simply plug in the HD micro console into your TV and grab the controller. How this system works is similar to other HDMI dongle sticks. First, it has to rely on wireless technology, using a 2.4 GHz wireless controller with advertised up to 150 hours of battery life. And that's probably true with the amount of power that these AAA batteries will provide. One thing that kind of concerns me is the 1080i output. I'm not quite sure this is going to make the graphics look as sharp as they would have on 1080p. The Flashback Blast consoles are available in a variety of different options, however I only picked up three of them. At the retail store where I saw these, they were priced at $30 a piece, however I ended up picking up all of these for under $30 total. I did order these consoles online, but each one came from a different online source. I chose these three consoles because I believe these are the ones that I would find the most entertaining. And if I were to choose a fourth one without trying any of them, I would have gotten the Pong console, but unfortunately that was not available at the time of my purchase. Their promotional video on this website, which I also used to open the video, shows everything that comes in the box, but I'll do my own unboxing here in a little bit. It also shows how to get the game set up, although I do believe the actual setup of this console is a little bit more complicated than the directions would have you believe. But we'll take a look at that here in a little bit. Taking a look at the back of each box, we'll show you the games that came on each of these systems. And from here, you may get a sense of how cheap it was to make each of these consoles. In my experience with these micro consoles, the more games that are offered on the back of the box, that means there's more likely to be less titles I'm going to find enjoyable. You know, they may pick one or two games that are actually good to sell the console, and then pack the rest of it with seemingly more value by adding these not-so-great titles along with it. But again, that is in my past experience. We'll see if this holds true when we go through all the games. Let's go ahead and take a look at the first game I got, which was the Activision Flashback Blast Pitfall Edition. It also looked like this box had been squashed by having something heavier set on top of it at one point. I'm hoping this didn't damage the console. Here are the controller stickers. Although this system supports two controllers, only one comes in the box. Thankfully, my other consoles will provide the second player controller if needed. And here's a little black and white poster showcasing the Flashback Blast. And on the other side, you'll find the instructions on how to use this console. And here's the controller itself. I have to say that I actually do enjoy this design, as it reminds me a lot of the Sega Genesis controller. My only nitpick is that the D-pad is really a joystick with a D-pad button kind of mounted on the front of it, so it doesn't operate like the Sega Genesis D-pad would normally. Another nitpick I have is that this thing actually takes AAA batteries instead of AA's. Which, from my perspective, AA's are more common in my household. I actually had to go out and buy some AAA batteries to get this controller working, as none of these consoles came with batteries. And here's the actual console itself that will plug into your TV. I like that it includes the USB power cord, although it is a bit short. It does not include an AC power adapter, however, you will most likely be plugging it into your TV if it has an available USB port. 
Moving on to the Space Invaders console, it is actually a lot more of the same. The advantage to buying more than one of these systems is that now I have a two-player controller, but that will be at the expense of having two people be able to use these consoles at once. And as I unbox the third console here, I'm actually very glad that these HDMI dongles are color-coded so that I can tell which ones they are. Otherwise, the stickers probably could have also provided some sort of unique identifier for each console stick. Overall, you can tell these consoles have a little bit of a cheapness to them. However, in this case, you get what you pay for. If you don't pay a lot for these consoles, I think right now you're getting your money's worth. But what's more important than how these consoles look and feel is how they actually perform. Alright, first I'm going to go ahead and get the controller ready. I actually salvaged some of these AAA batteries out of a flashlight that I was using, as when I started filming this video I actually didn't have any spare AAA batteries in my house. Alright, but now that those are in there, let's go ahead and get the dongle and the power cord and see if we can get this hooked up. So in initially looking at the directions on how to get this console powered on and get the controller connected to it, I did find out that the directions were a bit misleading, at least the way I interpreted them. But the proper way to get the controller paired with the dongle is to first power on the controller while holding up and the A button before you flip the power switch. Hold down the buttons until the light starts blinking on the controller, then power on the dongle. If all goes well, almost as soon as you turn on the power to the dongle, the controller light should turn solid, although in a couple of cases this took about 5 or 10 seconds. And then you're greeted with the game select menu. Alright, so first you'll notice that the image is actually a little bit unstable as there is a little borderline creeping up from the bottom. The top also had it too. I believe this is a product of the interlaced image, but I wasn't quite sure as not all of my consoles had this. And as we boot up the first game, you can also see some screen tearing as the Pac-Man logo scrolls up the screen. But anyway, as you see, this is Pac-Man as it should play. I believe this looks most like the NES version that came out, rather than the arcade version, which is a tad bit disappointing, but I understand they have to fill out more of the screen than the original arcade cabinet would have. It looks like that the image is also a bit more stable than before the game was booting up. As for the gameplay, I actually didn't notice any sort of input lag or any problems navigating around the maze, as I mentioned before that the directional pad is more like a joystick, and that makes it a little bit more easy to control Pac-Man than it would have if I had to move between directional buttons. Overall, this is a faithful port that will provide the entertainment like the original. Next, we will move on to Dig Dug, which also seems to be the NES version. Again, here I notice that the image does seem to jump up and down a little bit. Again, I do feel that this is due to the interlaced image, but it is a shame they decided to go that route because this actually did distract from my gameplay just a little bit. You may also notice now that the image is a bit more soft than sharp. It appears as if they are just upscaling the original image rather than actually applying any sort of filter over it to make it look better on a modern television. Overall, as I do find this game enjoyable, it may not provide as much entertainment as others as I did get bored of this title very quickly. Next we will move on to Galaga, which is a space shooting game and one of my personal favorites from this time period. This game is a bit like Space Invaders, only the ships move around a lot more and can sometimes suicide dive towards you. This will provide you with hours of entertainment if you're into this kind of game, however your thumbs will be sore in the morning. This is also the third game in a row where I noticed they were using the NES version. Next we move on to Galaxian, which is a lot more like Space Invaders and not as enjoyable as Galaga to me, but it is a much similar game. So much so, I would actually call this too close to Galaga to be included in the same collection. But I see this happen all of the time. Whenever someone offers Galaga as a main attraction, Galaxian is always included with it, which is okay, but it's like providing the same game twice. Again, we're dealing with the NES version, but it is a faithful port and the sound effects and graphics are of the time period. Next is a game called Mappy. And this was released in arcades in the 1980s, however, this is a game I have not cared for. I believe I have this for the NES, but I rarely if ever play it. And to be quite honest, I'm not quite sure exactly how to play this game, as I don't have that much experience with it. But it is included for those of you that are a fan of this game, it's just not one that I think is very good. Next we move on to Sky Kid, which is a horizontal side-scrolling shooter game that was released by Namco in 1985. On a side note, this actually ran on the same hardware as the Pac-Land game. I mention that because since Pac-Man was the initial title on this game, I thought that should have been included, but this is also a welcome addition. Again, we're looking at the NES version, which does reproduce the graphics and the sound effects in a nice manner. Basically, you taking the role of one of the Sky Kids have to take on certain missions that are assigned to you, and if you're successful, you're rewarded with another level. Overall, I did find this game a little bit hard to get into, but once I did, I did find it fun and enjoyable. Kind of similar to like those early side-scrolling shooters before R-Type and games like Gradius would set the standard for what a side-scrolling shooter should be. Next, we move on to the Tower of Druaga. 
This is the first game on this system that was never ported to the NES, so I'm not quite sure which version I'm playing here. But I have to say, this game is the hidden gem on this system. I had never played it before, but when I started, I almost couldn't put this game down. This game was initially conceived as a fantasy Pac-Man with combat, puzzle solving, and subtle role-playing elements. You take on the role of the hero Gilgamesh, whose goal is to rescue the maiden from the demon Druaga. To do this, you have to go through 60 floors of an immense tower. Gilgamesh equipped with a sword, which he can use to defeat monsters, and a shield which can be used to block magical attacks, must travel through progressively more difficult levels, beginning with simple slimes and ending with Druaga himself. Overall, I feel this game is a welcome addition to this console, and since I've never played this game before, this is probably the game that'll have me come back to this system someday. Last, we'll have a look at Xevious. Again, this game is a standard, this time vertically scrolling shooter, where the player must shoot down enemy aircraft and destroy enemy bases in order to make it to the end. Again, if you're a fan of the genre, you will really like this game. And I believe the NES does a good job of reproducing this game, but there is some sprite flickering that I notice every once in a while that I feel could have been eliminated if they would have allowed the use of modern processing power to eliminate that previous restriction. Overall, a welcome addition to this console. Overall, I do feel this console is worth it, especially if you're a fan of any one of these games. I would definitely recommend it just for the Tower of Draga alone, if you can get it for a decent price. I would wait until this console goes on sale, or at least find it on one of the online partners that I did, rather than buying it in store. If you're a retro collector like me that already has all of these games, this may be a little bit of a moot purchase. You're not getting anything extra such as upgraded graphics or sharper clarity on a modern display. The only thing you get is that these things are automatically put out through HDMI, although they are all a bit soft in terms of image quality. Next we have the Legends Flashback Blast featuring Space Invaders. Now, I'm not going to be able to showcase all of the games on this console, but I'll showcase a few of them that I thought were noteworthy. First, we'll look at Space Invaders. I feel this game is classic and iconic. Although I'm not quite sure which version they're using here, it's definitely not the one from the Atari, and to my knowledge, this was not on the NES. It's not the arcade version because it has color graphics, and in the arcades, they just used a color overlay to make the screen appear to have color. But either way, this is not a bad port of it, because it performs just like the arcade game should, and it even includes the classic sound effect that made everyone a bit on edge when playing this game, that theme of doom, as the space invaders slide down the screen. Here's where things take an unfortunate turn. This is Burger Time. Believe it or not, you're actually looking at the Burger Time game that was released for the Atari 2600. The only reason it makes sense that this game is on this console, at least this version, is that this is from At Games. They probably already have the license to distribute this game, as they've made a lot of Atari Flashback products. The problem is, this game does not look very good. It doesn't perform very good, the graphics are barely discernible as what's supposed to be on the screen. I mean, some of the characters are just flickering squares. Overall, it is playable, but it's certainly not as enjoyable as if they would have included something like the original arcade version. And again, the next game, Burning Rubber, is another unfortunate Atari 2600 representation of it. Then there is Escape It, which I don't find enjoyable. I actually have no idea how to play this game or what's going on on the screen. Frontline is actually an enjoyable Atari 2600 game. However, I do agree that the graphics haven't aged well with this game, but as far as Atari 2600 games go, this one is one of the better on this console. There are a couple other games on here that may be enjoyable. Jungle Hunt and Lock and Chase are probably two other games that I had played often on the Atari 2600, but there's really nothing else noteworthy on this console. So that said, out of the consoles I have in this selection, I would actually rank this one as probably my least favorite. One more console to go, and this is the Activision Flashback Blast. Again, as there are many titles on this one, I will only showcase a few of them. First is Pitfall, which I believe is the grandfather of almost all platforming video games. Although not as enjoyable as more modern ones such as the Mario series, this game is actually kind of fun and very involved for an Atari 2600 title. Playing this game with a directional pad rather than the joystick does make it a bit easier, but no matter what I do, I still fall into the gator's mouse whenever I'm trying to cross the water. I didn't use the rewind function as much as I feel that is a bit cheating, but I did use the pause button quite frequently, and that is probably the biggest upgrade from the original experience of these games. Atlantis is a standard kind of tower defense game where you have to shoot down enemy spacecraft before they take out the city of Atlantis. Beam Rider is one of my favorite Activision games produced from the 1980s. This is the Atari 2600 version, which is not my favorite version of this game, but it's certainly playable. The goal is to basically not get hit by any enemy projectiles or enemies themselves while taking out the specified number of spaceships in each level. 
Here is Chopper Command, which kind of reminds me of a cross between Defender and Sky Kid, only this would be the Atari 2600 version of it, I guess. Crackpots is another kind of tower defense game where you try to keep spiders from crawling into holes near your flower pots. Here is Decathlon, and to run in this game, you actually have to flip the D-pad back and forth, just like you would have to originally flip the joystick back and forth in order to run. I did find the field events a lot more enjoyable than the runs and the sprints. Since playing this game, I don't think the feeling has really fully returned to my fingers. And here is the infamous Dragster game that has really gotten a lot more famous recently due to a famous cheater that played this game. But really, it's kind of one of those games that if I would have bought it back in the day, I would have been disappointed because it's very simplistic. And then there's Enduro, which is actually one of my favorite racing games that was released for the Atari 2600, especially because it goes through a lot of different terrain changes, which was not very common on Atari 2600 titles. I especially like at night how you can only see the taillights of the cars rather than the whole cars themselves. It took a lot of clever programming to get this game to work back in the day, and so I still think it's kind of impressive for the hardware they were working with. Then there's Fishing Derby, which is, I guess, about as good as a fishing game can look on the 2600. Then there's Freeway, which is kind of like an early version of Crossy Road, I guess. Frostbite, which I am not entirely sure how to play. And here's the hidden gem of this system. This is Hero. I gotta tell you, I had never played this game before, and it sounds very generic, but I think this is probably the best game on the system, right up there with Pitfall. It's an action platformer game where you actually traverse across different screens while firing weapons, and you have to have a strategy of how to get through each area. Your goal is to rescue people in peril in each level. You lose a life if you get hit by an enemy, but you can keep going as long as you can keep rescuing people in time. Keystone Capers is also kind of a fun game where you play a police officer trying to catch a criminal running around the level. I would have liked to have shown you more games on this system, however, things took a turn for the worse while I was capturing footage for this console. When I started Mega Mania, I noticed that the graphics looked a little bit distorted, so I exited the game, went back to the menu, and rebooted the game, and it did the same thing. But then I tried playing games I had previously played fine, and they were all doing the same thing. I unplugged the console, plugged it back in, and now... This console is dead. It will not turn back on, and I can't get it to do anything. I'm not quite sure if this is a flaw of this console from the manufacturer, or if it's because this is the console that came in the most damaged box. Either way, I can't continue to finish the games on this console. Alright, so what are my thoughts on these flashback blast consoles? First, let's talk about console design. I actually like the small form factor of these consoles because they can be easily concealed in your gaming setup and the wireless controller is a nice touch because then you don't have to worry about connecting and having cords be dragged across your living room or your game room or wherever you hook this up. My only criticism of the design is actually the power cord only being about a foot long. It didn't actually hinder my setup because I was plugging this into an HDMI switch and I had a USB port available right there. However, I believe most of you may have to have an extension cord for your AC power adapter to have it reach where your television is. That's not an issue for me, but it may come up for you guys. The controller design is also very good as well. I thought that that joystick having the D-pad mounted to the top of it would actually be a hindrance, but it's nothing I really noticed too bad during gameplay. And because I'm already used to the Sega Genesis controller, I actually found the setup of this to be quite user-friendly, and the controls were easy to figure out for each game. Moving on to graphics and sound, I think this is where my biggest criticism comes in for these consoles. It seems like that At Games believes that their customer base for this is going to be people who originally played these games. I couldn't imagine that younger kids today, wanting to know what these games were like, would want to play them on this console because they don't really do the games a very good service by very shoddily upgrading them to a modern display. 1080i does not look as good as something that would have 1080p, maybe adding some filters. I actually would not recommend any of these consoles because of the problems I had with them. Many reviews that I've seen with these consoles say that they had a problem getting the controllers to sync with the console. I actually didn't have that problem at all, so I can't really speak to that as much. What I did have a problem with was getting the consoles to work well. Halfway through capturing footage, all of a sudden my TV wouldn't pick up the sound. My capture card did, but the TV just wasn't putting anything out. Even bypassing the card, the TV still wouldn't put out sound. So I'm not quite sure if that was my TV setup, but it also did the same thing when I moved it to my game room projector. 
So there was something that my projector and TV didn't like about the audio that was coming out of this console. Then there were the technical glitches, the bounciness of the image, and the fact that my Activision console just quit working altogether about halfway through me playing the games for the first time, leads me to tell you that I would actually not recommend buying these consoles. Maybe if you see them on clearance or in a thrift store, you can pick them up and maybe display them on your shelves, but I don't really think I'm gonna find myself coming back to these consoles too often. And that's a shame because there are hidden gems on each of these console sticks, and there's a lot of fun to be had there, but I don't think the build quality is up to the standards that we would expect out of these consoles. My least favorite was the Space Invader stick. It had a lackluster game library, and I wasn't really impressed with the titles they decided to include on it, and the fact that they only kept using the Atari 2600 games when they probably should have used some of the arcade versions, or at least a better port. However, if you want to ignore my advice and you really feel like you want to try one of these things out on your own and maybe you'll have better luck, you can do that, but I would definitely not recommend paying retail price for these. $30 for the off chance that it might work, might not work, is not really a good philosophy for purchasing any of these products. But anyway, that's just my thoughts. Have you guys tried these things, or have you guys tried any of the other flashback consoles? Let me know in the comments below. Let me know if you had a good experience. Let me know if you guys had an experience similar to mine. That said, guys, this is about going to wrap it up for this video. Remember, if you like what you see, please hit that like and subscribe button. It really helps me out and supports this channel. Again, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, if you enjoy the content of this channel, please remember to click on this subscribe button. Again, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. If you'd like to see some of the content I've already done, feel free to click on some of the suggestions that are popping up on your screen. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.